is this anybody's first time here? Yes. Yeah. Show me hands. How are you loving it? I don't care what Savannah, Georgia tells you. I'm not saying they're not haunted. We got to beat. We're older. We're 300 years old this year. So has everybody had some good food since they've been here? Yeah. Have y'all had some good drinks? I see some of you got some going on. We can do it in the street. You know, sometimes the more spirit you drink, the more spirit you might see. You never know for sure. <laughs> but anyway, tonight we are going to have a history and ghost walk of the Lower French Quarter. You're going to learn some of your, our legends and lore. You're going to hear some of our ghost stories. You are going to get a bit of history here. Can't help it. And you're going to get a little introduction into the history of voodoo. Because y'all have an initiated voodoo priestess as a tour guide tonight. So, a bit of a history lesson here. As I said, we are 300 years old this year. We were founded in 1718 by Jean-Baptiste Le Moyne de Bienville of France. Now, we are named Louisiana because Louis XIV was the king of France at the time. And so we are the land of Louis. Now, the first neighborhood built, and this was the entire city at the time, was the French Quarter. We had two major fires here. We had one in 1788 that happened on Good Friday, and it burnt down 80% of the city. We had 1,156 buildings, we had 1,100 buildings, 856 burnt to the ground that night. We then had another fire in 1794, that, and it started only a block away from the first one. Burnt down over 200 more buildings. We hadn't even come close to finish rebuilding from that first fire. Most of our early French buildings were built out of cypress, which is our most common tree here, but it's a very oily wood. It does very well in floods. It just does not do so well in fires. So we rebuilt in the brick and the stucco that we are known for all the courtyards. That's all Spanish. Today in the French Quarter, we only have three original French buildings left. We have more, we have French buildings, but there's only three originals. And across the street from us here, this green and white building that looks like it doesn't belong, that is one of them. Oh, wow. And it's the only one that we have left that was a residence. So that is what the French Quarter used to look like. What? Wow. A lot different. Yeah. A lot different. That is a classic example of a raised French colonial. Wow. I much prefer our Spanish style, honestly. Mm. <laughs> this is where they filmed the bathing scene in the movie 12 Years a Slave. And it's also where they filmed the coffin scene an interview with a vampire. Ooh. That's a good old movie. Now they did something really fun in that movie I'll tell you about. And this is some good old New Orleans lore for you. There is a scene, it's a funeral scene. Everybody is going a different direction. We've got carriages and hearses and it looks very chaotic. They're all going to the same place. They're all going to the cemetery. This is the way we used to do funerals down here. Everybody went a different direction. We did no processions and it was known as spirit confusion. And it was done to confuse the evil spirits so they wouldn't follow you in the cemetery. But if you just look up for a minute here, you're gonna see spikes wrapped around these poles. See that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, you'll see this periodically throughout the city. This is what we call a Romeo spike, or a Romeo poker. These were put on buildings by families who had daughters. <laughs> So the Romeos <laughs> couldn't climb up to the galleries to get their Juliets. Wow. And just in case you think that looks a little too easy to get over, we have other booby traps woven into the ironwork. Oh, that right. you oh. See my gosh. <laughs> wow. So as you're walking around. You see the those spikes? <laughs> now you're going to do it. You looked up from time to time. And you Romeo see can't get the Juliet. <laughs> no. Oh, you're going to know it was a house that had daughters in it. They used to say, up a Romeo, down a Juliet. <laughs> yeah, we took our girl's virtue very seriously. <laughs> Andrew Jackson Hotel. Well, this is another story about yet another fire. This building at one time was a private boarding school for boys. A fire broke out and sadly everybody in this building was killed, including the children. It was very, very tragic and very sad. But I'm here to tell you right now, the boys still live there. For many years, this hotel has gotten complaints. <laughs> 
we'll go with it. What are you gonna do, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> For many years, the front desk has gotten complaints about kids running up and down the hallway, laughing and giggling and screaming, <laughs> making noises, making mischief, playing ball out in the courtyard. I've had many friends stay here over the years. I've had many people on my tours over the years. They've all talked about the laughing children in there. For a lot of years, this was an adults-only hotel, so there were no children staying there. Uh -huh. In addition to that, it seems the boys have learned how to take over the remote control. Uh -huh. And they will turn that television set on at any given hour of the day or night, whether you're in the room or not and scroll through the channels till they find what they're looking for. I've been told it's the Cartoon Network. <laughs> I honestly don't know if there's any truth to that, but I do like that story. <laughs> I did that one time telling me they were staying there, they fell asleep watching a movie and they woke up and the Cartoon Network was on. <laughs> My very favorite thing that they did, not, you all aren't going to remember this, but a whole bunch of us here are going to. Once upon a time, we had to go get our film developed. <laughs> yes, we did not have digital cameras. We could not do it on our phones. So people would come down on vacation, and they would go home. They'd go to get their film developed and pick up their photographs. So they'd come down. They'd go pick up their photographs. They'd start sorting through. They're reminiscing about their time here in New Orleans. And then they'd find pictures of themselves. <laughs> Sleeping. Oh no. Taken from above. Whoa. Yes, indeed, the boys of the Andrew Jackson. You want to come stay here? She said no. Folks, this is really more of a photo opportunity for all of you. Very often, paranormal activity will appear on camera that you can't see with the naked eye. Really, the reason for that, more than anything else, is our own brain filters that the cameras don't have. Now this is a place where we've gotten a lot of interesting things on film, and this is what we call a hot spot. There's orbs in here frequently, as well as ectoplasms and vapors, but we have gotten apparitions. Apparitions are ghosts, and they are a figure of a person. The ghost that we see in here is a small child. He's usually over here by the soda fountain. Towards the back, we get a lot of orbs, we get a lot of vapors. That's more of a smoky substance where you can actually sometimes blow it up and see things in there. And over here, we've got some cool stuff out of this place. What I am gonna do is move out of the way so that you can all have a chance to try to uh, capture the little ghost. We don't know his name, we think he was a slave child, so we call him Casper. Several shots of the same thing because sometimes you'll see if something appears in one and not another. So I'm going to move out of the way and see if you can all try to capture Casper. And also, don't discard anything for a couple of days. You never know what you might discover. So everybody, have at it. As well. Okay, well, I've got video. Y'all do pictures. Take some different angles. Now our reflection in the glass will show up in the pictures. Everything here is haunted. We got more dead people than living. Anyway, across the street from us here, this very large gray mansion. It's one of the largest mansions here in the French Quarter. It's also considered to be the most haunted house in the city. It is the Lalori Mansion. Yes, indeed. So for those of you. American Horror Story folks, that would be Kathy Bates. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> this is a bit of a disturbing story, but I'm going to tell you, I will not be as disturbing as some people because it has been embellished so much over the years that it's just gotten out of hand. And stuff that's being said about it just... So, I will start out by talking about Delphine McCarty. And she was the lady of the manor. Delphine was a very wealthy, white, French, Creole woman. Her family had plantation land all around the city, and they left her a fortune. She also was considered one of the great beauties in the area. She had three husbands in her lifetime. Now, her first two husbands died rather early in their marriages. They also left her a tidy sum. 
making her one of the richest women in the United States. Her third husband, Dr. Leonard Louis LaLaurie, now there's some nice alliteration there, <laughs> was a physician from France and he came over here. He was 20 years younger than she was. Oh. And they had a little indiscretion, producing a child. So then they got married. And they built this house in 1831. And at the time, it was the largest single family residence in all of New Orleans. And actually it wasn't this house. That house, I will tell you about what happened to it. But this is the right location. Now, as uh, the story goes, it was the largest house in the city at that time. People were clamoring to come see it. Delphine was a very prominent socialite and loved to show it off by having great and ga gala parties. Yes, okay. Standing at 11.40 Royal. Home of the beautiful, brilliant, and quite brutal Madame Delphine LaLaurie. A rich, talented, and gracious hostess a leader in the town's social life. What her admirers did not know about her was that this lovely creature tortured her slaves inhumanely. At one time, she was caught chasing a young girl with a young whip, with a whip, a bull whip. The young girl went all the way up to the roof and fell, she dove out of fear into the courtyard full of stones and she died. That actually happened. That little girl is one of the ghosts that haunts this place. Many years ago, the building that stood here was a Spanish barracks. This is Barrack Street. A block behind on Decatur Street is the old U.S. Mint, now the Jazz Museum. The building that stood there originally was the French Barracks, it's Barrack Street, and it was called Fort St. Charles. Now earlier in the tour, I talked about how the transition from French <laughs> to Spanish rule did not go well. The French and the Spanish didn't trust each other, they didn't like each other. The first governor that was sent down here by Spain was very ineffective and the French pretty much ran him out. So then they sent down a governor with force and he was nicknamed Bloody O'Reilly. I know, O'Reilly and he was Spanish, but it's true. <laughs> anyway, he came down here, marched over to Fort St. Charles, assassinated 24 of their highest ranking officers and then made a prison in that building for the rest of the soldiers. He would then periodically have them hanged from the flagpole in front of their families and the community to teach people a lesson. They were not going to tolerate any kind of revolutionary behavior. That building wanted to. Well, as I said earlier, the Spanish had us for 40 years. But when the French got us back again, and even though it was for only 20 days, they did not forget what happened at Fort St. Charles. So the first thing they did was come down here, march on in, gather up all the Spanish officers, take them out into what is now the parking lot, and assassinated all of them in retaliation. Ghosts of Spanish soldiers are sometimes seen in the pool area, in the barn, in the roofs. There's been other ghost sightings here as well. As there's, been, there's been several over the years. Every time they renovate a room upstairs, they seem to wake somebody up, which by the way is not uncommon. Uh, ghosts can lie dormant, but then all of a sudden when you start doing renovations, they'll come back to life. Oh, cool.
so about halfway through the tour, you're gonna stop here and for a little break and some air conditioning and this. Oh, look who I found. Jason down there at the far end of the bar. So you can get some refreshments. We are sitting out here. Oh, this beautiful pool. That pool looks beautiful. It does look beautiful. Nobody's in it. Every time I see water, it's dark. Yeah, it's dark out here, sir. Every time I see pretty water, I just want to give you some trunks. I brought your swim trunks. But they're at the back of the room. But we have a pool at our hotel. And that is what a whole bunch of hurricanes look like. <laughs> Happy hurricane. Happy hurricane. <laughs> All right, here, let me try. Yeah. I typically don't like these, so let's see. That one's, that one's actually a good one. Okay, yeah, that's not that, bad. That's better than, yeah. yeah. It, the they are better than, uh, in right. my opinion, yeah. better ones. This is a good place for her. This is your actual like Yep. Yes. I normally don't like hurricanes. This is not that. That is good. It's good. It's good. good. Going back on the route, this is where I talk a little bit about the history of voodoo here in the city. This is something that has come to us. Voodoo is a religion. Probably the most misunderstood and misrepresented religion there is. It came to us over 300 years ago from two places, the slave trade in Africa, and also we had 10,000 refugees from the Haitian Revolution come over here during the revolution. France owned Haiti, they owned us. So that also added to our numbers of free people of color as well. Here in New Orleans, we have a few different kinds of voodoo. We have Haitian voodoo, we have African voodoo, and we have what we call New Orleans in plantation voodoo. Can you all hear me behind me? Mm -hmm. Which is kind of a combination of the two of those and a whole lot of Catholicism thrown into it. Mm -hmm. Voodoo and Catholicism has lived side by side, hand in hand, and in spite of each other for over 300 years, not going anywhere. <laughs> but there was a reason for some of that. But I will give you just a brief synopsis. I'm not going to get into this too deep because that's a whole different tour. However, Voodoo is a monotheistic religion, meaning we have one God, one vast God, so vast you cannot personify it. The cornerstone of the religion is honoring your ancestors, both your family ancestors as well as spirit ancestors that have been Hold personified. That. They're also elemental. It's more of a nature-based path. In Haitian Voodoo, we call those spirits Lawa. In African Voodoo, we call them Orisha. Now, here's how the Catholicism got thrown into it. There was a time here where being a Catholic was the only recognized religion that you were allowed to practice. We are the most Catholic city in the United States. And they were so strict on this that they would have a priest down at the docks. And when the slave boats would come in, the first thing that happened when they got taken off those boats is they got christened Catholic. Hmm. Well, how they made that work and still be able to practice their native religion was they would find a Catholic saint that had similar qualities as their spirit Lawa or Arisha and they would worship through that saint or hide behind it or a little bit of both but it became so ingrained that today probably 80% of Buddha practitioners here and also in Haiti are Catholic as well. Marie Laveau, some of you have probably heard of her, 
was a devout Catholic, remained a devout Catholic her entire life, raised her children Catholic. They were all baptized at St. Louis Cathedral. Across the street from us here, this cool looking yellow house, that is known as the Beauregard Kai's house. And it was one time the home of General PGT Beauregard, the man who fired the first shot in the Civil War. Now, he only lived there for about six months. It was a boarding house, and he lived there after the war. He was also known as the Great Creole. But they say when he was there, he suffered great depression and guilt over the number of lives that were lost in the various battles that he headed up. And they say he used to sit there and reenact them in his head over and over and over again. So much so that a lot of people believe he manifested those battles right into the living room. Because the number one haunting that goes on in here is battles in the living room. <laughs> Sounds of cannon fire in the background. And ghosts of soldiers are sometimes seen running up and down the staircase. Wow. This has gone on since he left. Now over the years, the house started to fall into disrepair. But in the 1950s, it was purchased by author Frances Parkinson Kyes, and she restored the house to its initial grandeur. However, she was so disturbed by the hauntings going on in the living room that she refused to live in the main house, so she just lived in the slave quarters in the back. And she had lost her dog while she was here. He died of old age. So his ghost is sometimes seen on the porch and in the gardens. So we've got, well, soldiers and cannons and battles, oh my. And the little dog, too. What kind of dog? No, it's, it's a Greek revival. However, uh, yes, because we had some architects down here trying to do some unique things. It is rain. Across the street from us <laughs> is the Provincial Hotel. Now, the Provincial was at one time Confederate Hospital. Yeah. All right, I'm going to ask you to move up so these folks can get through. Oh, okay. oh no, they walked around. Okay. Anyway, during, during the Civil War, it was, I said, a Confederate hospital. Now, during the war, we were one of the very first cities taken over by the Union Army. The first thing that happened when they got into the South was they burned the city of Atlanta, because that was the largest city in the Confederacy. Then they came down here capture the port. And that was pretty easily done because most of our guys were out fighting. So they captured the port. They stopped all shipments of food and supplies from coming into the south in an effort to starve them out. This also included medical supplies. We got a bit of a problem. We're at war. We got to have a hospital. So we had to make do with what we had available to us. What we had available to us was whiskey. Great. Good stuff. Good stuff. Really? Amen. What do you need? And we used it for everything. They used it to clean out wounds as an antiseptic, and that really did help. But then it was the closest thing to anesthesia that we had. So if you were lucky, you got a shot of whiskey and a leather strap to bite on if you were having an amputation. And we did a lot of amputations back then because of the way the guns were designed. And oh, by the way, we did our amputations with a hand saw. <laughs> then we had to cauterize it. Mm. And we did that with a hot cast iron skillet. Is that the spice Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That is the best thing ever. In addition to that mess that I just described to you, we didn't have proper dressings or bandages, so people had to give up their sheets, their petticoats, curtains, whatever could be used for bandages. In the case of a heavy bleeder, say a gunshot wound, what they would then do is take cornmeal and wrap that in muslin, pack it into the wound, and then tourniquet it on. Now, the cornmeal would expand as it absorbed the blood, and so it helped, it helped control the bleeding a lot. But it led to another big problem. Infection? That too. Blood. 
The one I'm thinking about though is rats. Oh. No. Got me next. And they'd climb up and they'd start climbing up and they'd start chewing on the cornmeal. Oh God. <laughs> so then somebody got the great idea to give these guys guns to shoot the rats with. <laughs> oh my God. Right. That didn't go well at all. <laughs> No, they were shooting their own feet off, they were shooting each other. <laughs> not a good idea. It didn't work out so well. This was not a place anybody wanted to be. However, I will say, eventually wars end. Life goes on, we move forward, now we have a lovely little hotel in the French Quarter. <laughs> That's haunted. Like almost all of like our French Quarter hotels. Yes. <laughs> Hey. I told this event didn't have anything on us. Hey. Anyway, the that whole thing the was the Spice Girls. was when the Spice Girls came by. <laughs> Nothing like the Spice Girls. We have some unique here. Yes. It has the uh, balcony on it. Yeah. Like all of them would call oh, like yeah. the balcony. <laughs> the beige one. Okay. okay. Yes. The beige balcony? That's what I mean. And then the little one next to it. Okay, that building used to be our city morgue. Today they rent it out as the park. Yeah, well, that's how we repurpose down here. <laughs> At one point, it was actually a bar called the Morgue, complete with a ghost in the bathroom and a coffin in the bar. Oh, that's oh. Awesome. wild. Yeah. That is awesome. That's a but this is actually where I talk about yellow fever. Because yellow fever wiped out thousands of our people, and it's a huge part of our history. And we are a city that's ripe for it. It's hot. It's wet, it's dirty. And we used to store our water in cisterns. Big old vessel that actually turned out to be a mosquito farm. And this, of course, is how the disease was spread. Now, our worst summer on record was the summer of 1853. We lost more than 10% of our population that summer alone. The hospital was filled to capacity. The morgue was filled to capacity. They had to start piling bodies up out in the streets in the summertime. Oh, I know. Ooh, that Ooh. smell. Yeah, you got it. And sadly, this is how some people found their relatives. Mm. The other problem is that we had such a huge epidemic that summer, we did not have enough doctors or nurses to take care of the problem. So mistakes got made, including people being pronounced dead when they actually weren't. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's a known as sleeping disease. Okay. Has anybody here been to our cemeteries? I know some of you have. Well, as as I most of you know, I'm a cemetery guy as well. If you were to go into the cemetery with me, especially this time of year in the summertime, you're going to notice that it's about 10 to 20 degrees hotter inside the cemetery than it is outside of the cemetery. The reason for that, for the most part, we bury above ground in family tombs and in wall vaults. It gets over 300 degrees inside those tombs. So. <laughs> Well, it's a very efficient use of land, and I'll tell you why. We don't embalm the bodies before we put them in there. We seal off the tomb and go back in after a year and a day, and it's nothing but bone and ash. Basically, what they are is natural crematoriums. It was the Spanish style of burial, and they were in control of the city when we built our first cemeteries up there. Not our very first cemeteries. Those were behind Jackson Square and on the river and on St. Peter Street. But because of yellow fever, they built up a little ways out of town. Well, after that awful summer, people went back in and they made a very gruesome discovery in that cemetery. Scratch marks inside the tombs. You got it, they got cooked alive. We did realize that was a problem. <laughs> yes, it is. So. Anyway, we borrowed a practice that they used to use over in England during the plague. You got it. When, it, when, it, when, it, when a body came into the morgue, they got bells on their toes. 
or on their hands. So if they moved in any way, if they regained consciousness, it could be heard. Now you're gonna get your trivia for the night. This is where the phrase saved by the bell actually came from. Hmm. <laughs> it was a lie. It was it was literally being saved by the bell. They were dead ringers. <laughs> no, I mean later on it became a boxing term and then of course we all know about screech. <laughs> but that's actually where it came from. It was a literal it was literal. You were literally being saved by the bell. Also, another phrase that came out of this, which we use all the time, is the graveyard shift. Mm -hmm. Somebody had to work in the graveyard overnight to listen for the bells. You got it. So that's how the overnight shift became known as the graveyard shift. Mm. A lot of people do. We have it here, too, but that's how it started. So anyway, you got your little lesson and trivia tonight. Okay, so this is this is the ex morgue th that she was talking about. Hey, so we just finished our haunted history tour. I really enjoyed it. Jason really enjoyed it. The boys, the boys enjoyed, enjoyed it. it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, they're just tired. So we're walking back to the hotel now. Uh, our map tells us it's a 25 minute walk. Yay. So uh, everybody's really yeah. excited about we that. Burn off Danny's. Yeah, we still gotta burn off our dinner. There you have. <laughs> <laughs> no. We were strolling on the haunted tour. Mom? We're trucking it now. There's a big difference in walking patterns. Oh, look at Jason back I need there. A lot. I need a lot. He's still so sipping on that hurricane because it is very strong. And if you drink it too fast, you're gonna fall down. Everybody's out. And yes, it is hot. Yes, my face is beet red. <laughs> but it, <It's> my <laughs> but that's Louisiana, and that's humidity, and it's okay. Now we're going to Jackson Square now. There's a lot of tours everywhere around the city. We've heard, we've seen so many tours. They're they're really cool. They're cool. I learned a lot today. It's Jackson Square at night. My little boys, my big boy. <laughs> so, good first day in New Orleans. Amazing. Yes, of course. It's always a good day in New Orleans. Isn't it though? I don't think we've ever had a bad day in New Orleans. We love it here. All of it. It's even better night in New Orleans. Oh yeah, when the sun's down, Look it's not that. so hot. Oh yeah. Oh, you know, I don't think we've ever been in Jackson Square at night. It's, it's off very anyway. peaceful at night. It's closed off anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. The gates are closed. We're home. Yay. Oh, no, we got to go by the front desk. Home. Yay. Look, this hotel's a lot bigger than you think. See, it's not just this building. It's that too. We're actually in that building. Yeah. So oh, this is a beautiful hotel. Wait, we're up all the way at the very top. I just realized.